So hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 217 of Level Up, 60 minutes, of course, of live Q&A, where your questions really do drive the show. If you're watching us over on YouTube, then, of course, you can find out much more about the work that APMG International does in our channel. So do please give this video a like and, of course, subscribe to find out much more. Ella is over in the social chat if you're joining live on LinkedIn or on YouTube today. So do please introduce yourself to her. Let her know your name and the city from where you're joining. She's going to post some links in so that you can vote up the questions that you would most like answered by the panel. And, of course, for you to be able to add your own as well. If your questions are selected, then your name's going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get yours in early and stay with us to see all of that happening. Change is, of course, as normal as, well, life, as growing up. New challenges and opportunities present themselves in our home and our working lives on a regular basis. Learning how best to embrace and manage change is a really a key skill, and the absence of which leads to greater uncertainty and ultimately chaos. So how do we build our capability as a change professional as we strive to learn more in 24? Helping us figure this out is a brilliant panel today. So let's jump straight in and meet them all. First of all, Stefan Brendel um, rejoins us today. He is, of course, responsible for APMG's business across Europe and Latin America. Stefan works closely with our partners working in change programs across all industries. Welcome back to Level Up, Stefan. Great to see you. Thanks, Nick. Um, very happy to be here today. Uh, let me start off with a quote from the famous um, author Dostoevsky, who once used to say um, that change is what people are afraid the most. I hope in this episode, with all my fellow panelists, we can give some advice how this can be made less painful. Absolutely, absolutely. And Dostoevsky, of course, lived in an era where there were plenty of things to be frightened about. So it's, yes. it's, a, good, it's a great quote to start us off, actually. So thank you, Stefan. Rob Lehman uh, rejoins today. He is, of course, a trainer and I would say trusted advisor, actually, who describes himself as your personal chauffeur on the highway of change, working with clients from all over the world from his base in Thailand. Ron is a pragmatic change <laughs> professional. Yeah, welcome I'm, back I'm, to Level Up, Ron. So welcome. Um, this is a late replacement for me, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm the one wearing the orange T-shirt, by the way, so you know who's talking when they're talking. And um, one thing I've just, just got to say that this year I am celebrating 50 years in the professional discipline of change. Do I look wow. that old? No, of course not. Not at all. Not at all. Thank you, Ron. And we're looking forward to tapping into some of that experience as we go through the show. Mads Lomholt is a partner and management consultant at Implement Consulting Group. He leads transformational change programs focusing on delivering real impact and working with leaders and stakeholders to truly understand their priorities and objectives. Welcome back to Level Up, Mads. Great to have you today. I'm great to be here, Nick, and thank you so much for having me here again. Um, I'm joining this show from Denmark, and uh, yes, I have a great passion with uh, uh, on running change, actually, and I'm looking so much forward to great discussions this uh, on the show, as usual. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. A wild and windy Denmark today. In fact, wild and windy across Europe, actually, um, at the moment. David McCreary uh, rejoins. He's a consultant over at Ulthris, where he works on coaching and mentoring project managers, their sponsors, senior people in leadership roles and so on, working across the finance, utilities, healthcare and public sectors. David focuses on delivering value to every client situation. Welcome back to Level Up, David. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and look, delighted to be here with you guys. Um, always a great discussion, and I think change is a very, uh, well, it's it's happening in most organizations, and it's a very big topic in a lot of the organizations that I'm uh, meeting with. Um, so, yes, it'll be very interesting to have this chat this morning. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining. Dr. Chris Muller completes our on-screen panel today. He's an independent educator, lecturer, and consultant who promotes international mindedness and global citizenship around the world, having worked extensively in Asia, the Americas, Africa, 
and Europe. In fact, I was running out of continents not to put a little pin in um, for you, Chris. Uh, he was selected also, interestingly, to be a TED Innovative Educator and serves on the TED Ed Advisory Board. So welcome to Level Up, Chris. It's great to see you. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm talking to you from Cape Town in South Africa, <clears throat> but my background in education, it's a world that is in need of change, and um, but often the most resistant to change as well. So it's a topic that has occupied my mind for a long time. I look forward to, to the discussion over the next hour. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we look forward to it too. So thank you, Chris, um, for joining today. Now, um, Level Up doesn't work without your questions, um, audience, uh, as producers, and also our question master, who works tirelessly to make sure that they're fed through to the panel. Um, Charlotte joins us today from the Thames Valley. Have you managed to uh, remain in the Thames Valley or have you been blown away to the land of Oz? Um, I'm not quite sure where I am at the moment, Nick. It's quite blustery out there so yes um, looking forward to today's show change is a fantastic topic isn't it just isn't it just absolutely well thank you very much indeed i can see lots of people joining online which is brilliant so we'll come to you in a few moments in the meantime charlotte let's have our first question to the panel please <laughs> thanks nick um a very simple question from mary in ireland mary asks what is a change manager Okay, Ron, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from David. Okay, no problem. Um, that's quite it's an interesting question. The, the, the main reason is I'm actually just writing an article called What is a Change Manager? Do we really know? Yeah, what is it? What is a change manager? Um, the, the further I delve into the article, the more questions there are. The first thing is, is the change manager organizational there's the change manager it's itsm there's two distinctions there so one looks after change control one looks after people but then if you think about it a little bit deeper you've got your certified change managers and your highly trained change managers but you've got your change managers who have been um will have a lot of experience a bit like me <laughs> 50 years um and so i'm kind of finding it a bit difficult to to put a change manager into a pigeonhole okay um and i think all i'm going to say is a change manager in a change initiative is everything for everyone okay all right well thank you very much indeed for starting us off thank you ron uh david your thoughts please and then we'll go to stefan well, my, yes, uh, my, my my first thought is that it's not a very easy question to answer, Charlotte. Uh, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, it's really key uh, to understand. Uh, I think for me, the easiest way to understand it is to understand the difference between a project manager, a change manager and a change agent. And I think that probably kind of helps me a little bit um, in understanding. Um, you know, a project manager is there to try and deliver the the results, to try and deliver the the, the product, um, the deliverables. Whereas a change manager is trying there to try and help people through the change. And a good project manager will take on the role of a change manager. They always will. But what we're trying to get to here is the emphasis and the emphasis of the change manager is around the people side of the change. And for me, that's what's really, really key is the people side of the change that a change manager works on with the organization and with the rest of the team uh, in the project. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, David. I think that you're right. I think. Um, uh, a fellow panelist on a previous Level Up show about change management described it as being the project manager prepares the solution for the organization. And the change manager's focus, primary focus, is about preparing the organization ready for the solution. So these two roles absolutely overlap in the Venn diagram of how do you do this stuff really well. Um, but they have a different focus, you know, and uh, very well put. So thank you, David. Stefan, your thoughts? Thanks, Nick. You almost nailed it down. What I wanted to say about these uh, these two roles, but I think you can, Mary, you can think of the change manager rather being in the second row and not at the front of the stage. 
it's the change manager is the person who makes sure that the change can happen. If it's on people, if it's on processes, if it's on cleaning the carpet, you name it. But that's what the change manager actually has to take care of. Thank you very much indeed. I was just trying to remember who came up with that really succinct summary. And it was a long time ago. It's about two and a half years ago, actually. I've got a feeling it was a fellow South African, Chris. It was a gentleman called Johan Bota, um, who was on one of the panels. So I'm kind of digging back in my memory a little bit. But, uh, you know, um, it's a good mantra to kind of consider and use that to you know think your way through. Uh, Chris, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I <clears throat> I believe that that a change manager is somebody who who keeps things in in perspective. Um, you can't blindly follow one particular methodology to in, institute any change, but you have to keep certain concepts in focus for it for the change to be successful. And I think a change manager is the person who makes sure all these elements of change are adhered to in some in some way or another without without stepping forward and being the authority that demands the change, because that doesn't work either. Yeah, I agree. And Stefan made a really good point a little earlier about knowing where you are in that, you know, kind of leadership. He described it as being perhaps in the, you know, in the second row, if you like. So, um, you know, the project and the business and the initiative and so on might be taking you know, the absolute front position, but change management needs to be very, very close, very close behind. So almost half a step behind, I suppose. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, panel. What a great question to get us going. Um, let's go over to social, see who's joined us online this morning. Caleb uh, joined us, a regular viewer. He's joining from Stoke-on-Trent in the heart of the United Kingdom. So thank you, Caleb. Welcome today. Great to see your contribution in the chat as well. And uh, Dami uh, joins from West London this morning. Uh, welcome, Dami. Great to have you online. Um, looking across as well, we've got uh, Idara, who joins from Nigeria. We've got so many regular followers. Now. It's brilliant. So welcome back, Idara. Great to see you, my friend, and to have you as part of the production team today. And Bola's Law, of course, uh, always a really insightful contributor. Uh, Boleslaw joins us from Poland. So thank you very much indeed. Um, if you have a question to the panel, of course, just type it into the social chat and Ella will make sure that it's brought into the panel. And then talking about that, Charlotte, let's move on and we'll take our next question, please. Um, our next question is from Patrick Hendricks. Is an iterative Iterative approach, also the best possible approach for organisational change management. It's a really interesting concept, isn't it? Taking the iterative approach. Madge, you've done a lot of this kind of work. What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, thank you. And it is uh, such a great question and a complex one, I would say. So um, it all starts with what are you actually uh, delivering? Uh, so what kind of project are you delivering? Is uh, and you can take different approaches to this. You can have a big bang where you need everybody to, you know, adhere to and comply with the change. Or you can have this iterative uh, approach, either from, for an organizational split or from a people or, or no, not the organizational split and the, the task split. And I would say in very many uh, cases, I would, I would encourage to take an iterative approach because it's easier to you know swallow bits and pieces of the change rather than a big huge one but in many cases or in in, in few cases we need the big one but i would prefer always the iterative approach because it's easier to you know accept and and uh, work by i think that you're right it's 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 natural as well that we, we don't know everything at the beginning of something. Yeah. So you kind of discover stuff along the way. So iterative can be super helpful from that point of view. Um, David, what are your thoughts on the iterative approach being the best one? Yeah, you know, th this really depends on the organization that you're working in and a number of other factors. I mean, I think the first thing, iterative or non-iterative, it's really important that people understand what the vision and the goal is for the change. 
And then we need somebody in the organization, like a change manager, to make sure people are able to deal with either a big bang change or an iterative. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. So we need to have somebody have taught that through. Um, the big bang can be quite severe, but allows us to bed in a change over time. The iterative, there can be some change exhaustion with people getting it constant. So, so what for me is really, really key is that uh, the team who are the change targets are fully aware of what the benefits, the reason and why we're doing that. So they've got the capability to deal with that. So it's kind of um, horses for courses, unfortunately. I'd agree with that. I think, you know, a lot of anxiety comes from people not understanding the, might not know the final destination, but not understanding the direction of travel, you know, and the, it feels like, you know, why are we doing this? We're not aligned with, you know, um, the direction of travel that we're supposed to be going in, those sorts of things. So knowing that's up front, super important. The actual journey along the way, yes, there may be a few little twists and turns, but nonetheless, knowing that Strategic direction is super important. Thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, Ron, your thoughts, then we'll go to Stefan. Yeah, to specifically answer the question, no, it's not the best possible approach, to be honest, because each change is different. You know, um, at the moment, we've got sort of people arguing that agile change is, you know, coming to the fore, there's other types of changes, waterfall change, people are saying, yes, it's still the same. But I just get, I get the feeling, and I think David said this, that it depends very much on the organizational context and the context of what you're actually delivering into that organization. Okay? Um, so it could be hybrid if you want. You can have some waterfall activity, you can have some iterative activity, and in terms of um, implementing some kind of quick win process, yes, it's good to see if you can get something implemented during the life cycle of the project. It's good because people will see um, um, action, they will see activity, they'll see things being delivered. So that will get them more behind the change than being resistant. Yeah, it's certainly true. You want to be part, feel part of something, don't you, rather than having it done to you. So thank you, Ron. And Stefan, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm not sure if I, uh, maybe I don't understand the question correctly, but if I think that change is also about people, about knowing where you are, about allowing room for emotions, allowing room for making failures, mistakes, then I think, how can it be without iteration? Because how can you check if you don't have an iterative approach? Where, how can you check where you stand and how people feel with the change? So my answer would be, I think it's absolutely, it would be a mistake not to use an iterative approach. And I agree with Ron, there might be hybrid versions, but I think it, you have to keep in mind, how do you want to achieve people are getting with the change are following that without having an iteration yeah i agree with that you know without any kind of feedback loop then you simply don't know if you're improving or falling back you know you need to plot your progress on a map to be able to see that the journey is working <laughs> okay yeah. and you also need i think the feedback to be able to rethink you know um every explorer didn't necessarily, you know, um, ever have to retrace their steps. I think sometimes when you're exploring change, it's the right thing to do. Retrace your steps a little bit, regroup, rethink, reform, and then progress again. And have that confidence, as Stefan says, to be willing to fail. OK, try things out. Be willing to fail and create a culture of safety around doing so. So thank you, Stefan. Thank you, panel. Great start to the show. Fascinating. And uh, Ella's just saying um, to the audience and to our producing team, who, of course, everybody who's watching online, um, if you have a question, then just pop it into the chat. Charlotte, on that note, I think we should move on. Let's take our next question to the panel. Nick, um, another question from Mary in Ireland. Are certifications or experience more important when becoming a change manager? 
All right. So certifications or experience. So this is one of those contrasting things. And I think we're going to get a range of different views on this. So let's start with the pragmatic and practical Mr. Lehman. So Ron, start us <laughs> off. What do you favour, experience or certifications or a little bit of both? OK, I've had 50 years in the business and I'm not certified. OK. I've not been, tra I've been trained right at the beginning, but I'm not certified. But the jury, I'm, I think the jury's out, to be honest, because um, in, in, in the um, uh, article I mentioned earlier on actually covers certification and experience and the pros and cons of each. Um, I used to be against certification, very much against certification, but I introduced it into my training because my trainee wanted it. Um, certification demonstrates that you have taken the time and the energy to look at what you want to do and take a relevant qualification. Okay? But it's the start. It's an entry point. Yeah. What I get a little bit fed up with is people saying, hey, I've just got through so and so and I'm ready to you know, manage change. Well, you won't be for about two or three years, to be honest. Yeah. You, you're ready to work in change, but you're not ready to manage it. Um, experience is a different one. Um, experience, you know, you, you don't have the proof that you've actually taken the time to um, you know, go through some training and get certified, but you have oodles and oodles and oodles of, I mean, if I go, can't, I can't even think about going back over my 50 years. But if I go back over my 50 years, the number of projects, et cetera, I've been involved in and the different aspects of them, they give me so much knowledge, so much wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, I can't think of the word at the moment, but it is so important for me to have that knowledge. And... You know, if I'm honest, I don't give two hoots about if I'm certified or not. So okay. that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. That's uh, certainly one perspective. I think we might come back to experience um, with your patients in a little while. I'm going to go to David next and then after him come to Chris. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, going to say that that it's not so much about certification, but I think change manager, I think key thing in cha cha for a change manager is to educate yourself um, because there's a number of theories that are out there that I think are really useful to understand, to understand why people resist change, why people ignore the change, why they don't turn up for meetings, why somebody feels that they're their experience are now not, uh, not, not really sort of accredited by the organization. So, so there's lots of theories that I think are really, really key that you don't always fully understand from experience. You know, you, you, you've experienced it, but looking at the theory, sometimes you go, hang on a second, that's why uh, particular individuals resisted the change. It wasn't because they were like, didn't like the company, but be actually because they felt their competencies were not going to be appreciated in the new environment. So, so to me, there's a dozen or so of those theories that I think you need to educate yourself on that will help you understand what's going on. And it'll also help you articulate to senior managers why the change needs to be done at a certain pace, be that speedy or, or slower. So for me, it's it's less about the certification more about the education and you need to educate yourself i believe on some of the background to change in order to understand and I, i'll say this oftentimes you kind of know this stuff already but actually when you see some of the research behind it it just gives you more power to articulate with people around you absolutely thank you david uh chris what are your thoughts on this and then we'll go to Mance. I think we've lost. Uh, oh, Chris has come back. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with David. Uh, that's why um, I, I that that was that was exactly going to be my comment. That you have to arm yourself with a theory. Um, that experience goes a certain certain distance, but um, in the end, 
you know, you, you have to back it up with, with some so, solid um, theory. So certification, whether you get certification or not, is not the issue, but you need to arm yourself with theory. Okay, thank you very much, Adit. I think um, uh, it's an important thing to know what your experience is. And if you don't have that base understanding of theory and practice, how do you know whether your experience is just in a little bubble or indeed if it's actually the kind of experience which is going to work well in a range of different situations. So very important. Uh, Mads, your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you so much. And, and, and again, a great question. And uh, for me, I don't believe that it is, it is an either or. I mean, do I need either a certification or experience? I think it's, it's a both and question actually. Uh, both certification and experience may be valid in order to become a great change manager, actually. So, and especially uh, if change or if, if certification involves knowledge, it's not the paper itself, it's the knowledge that you actually get, then I think it's uh, important and effective. I mean, how can I be, a, you know, running a financial company or a financial department without knowledge about financial stuff? And how can I run change without change stuff and change knowledge. So I think both are very experienced, but I think that that change is also a people thing. And I working with people, understanding people, it's not about reading books. It's about being out there, you know, working with people. So I think both are, are definitely uh, crucial to this or important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with that. Thank you um, very much indeed, Mads. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to take the view that also talks about this blend, all right? And I try and articulate it in a particular way. Started my career as an organizational change management consultant. And I think when you're young, you imagine, as Ron hinted at, that if you've learned something, you know all the answers. And then experience kind of tells you over time that actually you've got a lot to learn. Um, I do absolutely thoroughly believe that um, educating yourself, as the panel have said, is the key to this, both in theory and also in practice and in real life. So there's a range of qualifications that you could take, and I would focus on qualifications rather than certifications as the correct word here, because you're trying to qualify yourself, if you like, um, and qualifying means reaching a certain standard whether you're running in the olympics or whether you're trying to understand the theory and practice of organizational change so um, the change management institute is a really good organization huge membership organization worldwide based in australia of course um, so their work is well worth considering to learn and the qr code is on the screen for you there and um, i guess also in addition to that if you're not necessarily the sole leader of the change and you don't have that job role but you want to improve how your individual contribution can be made then consider um, becoming a change agent and thinking about your role and responsibility in that you know this will help your organization considerably at the other end of the spectrum if you want to deep dip a little bit more into how people think Neuroscience is a great way of considering all of that and starting to build up your understanding and experience of not just the behavior that you witness firsthand through your lived experience as a change manager or as a change leader, but also the theory and practice that goes behind that. Why do human beings tend to behave in certain ways? And if you know those little hacks, how can you use those to best advantage? So just some things to consider there. So thank you, panel. And I think a great mix of opinion and a really great blend in real life is what makes for best success. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. I can see the questions stacking up. So I guess we should move on. This is a live question from one of our uh, viewers, Christopher Grenov. What are your thoughts on using choice architecture in change management? Choice architecture in change management. This is an interesting phrase, Christopher. It's not one that I'm terribly familiar with. Um, so we'll give the panel a moment or two to just kind of consider it. Um, Ron, why don't you start us off with your thoughts and then we'll hear from Mads. Sorry, I try to avoid hitting my... Um, um hand because I wanted somebody else to start I seem to be hitting the hand all the time um if choice architect 
architecture means model or methodology, which I'm going to assume it does, yeah, I think there's a place for a model or methodology in change management. Um, and there's a place for models and methodologies in change management. Uh, but I'm not a great believer in using just one way to manage change. So there are about 50 better known models out there. You know, and there's about another 20 that aren't well so well known. Um, and they all have very similar attributes to them, components, etc. Even my own does. I've got one, yes. Um, and the, the, the but the thing for me is when I went on to the contract market in whenever it was 1996, I think <laughs> I kind of went on the build, not buy route which meant that I would understand what capabilities the organization would already have in terms of change. So did they have a business analysis department? Did they have an HR department? Uh, did they have a uh, communication department? And I would say, okay, we'll use those within this whatever. And then I would look at some of the methodologies. I would look at the actual what was being delivered. Okay. And um, I would build a methodology for them. Okay. And the, the beauty of building a methodology, and I'll shut up in a minute, sorry. The beauty of building a methodology is you get immediate buy-in. You get people who say, well, he, he or she has come in to the organization, they've done their homework, they've sussed it all out, they've, you know, they've learned what all of the organization wants to do, and they've built a methodology specifically for us, which includes our culture and everything else. So, yes, um, not one, many. All right. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, Mads, this wasn't a term that I was familiar with at all, um, but I'm hoping that through your consulting work, you'll be able to guide us a little bit. Um, choice architecture and change management. Thank you so much. Neither was I actually, and I and I just followed Ron on his uh, way of thinking. But uh, thank you for clearing out uh, what the choice architecture was about, about, you know, um, Presenting decisions, presenting what are the alternatives? Should we go that way? Should we go that way? Or should we go that way? And presenting that to to the management. And and I think one of the the ways that I think in this case, when I face the project owner or the the steer coach or the management level, uh, and and need to present them different alternatives. Uh, on the way forward, I always think about the why, what, how. I mean, why are we doing this change? And, and what are we doing and how are we doing it? And then of course, include the whole risk thing, because I mean, presenting the why, what, how is always the happy flow. And we all know that uh, uh, changes do not always go as, as planned. So also presenting the risk thing. And of course, making sure that the alternatives that you present to the management uh, are impact driven. So, so uh, the whole effect driven mindset and the consequences of taking this decision, that decision, or that decision, and present your, of course, your favorite, and the arguments of why that is uh, your favorite, actually. Helping them to understand it is key, I think. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mads. And um, Steph, your thoughts, please, and then we'll go to David. Yeah, when it's about making a decision, choice architecture might be an option. When it's about, um, Delivering a change, and I think I spoke about that earlier, then choice architecture might be an option, but only it, it, there's several other ways. How do you convince people, or how do you make people part of the solution and not part of the problem of a change? So it, it, I think choice architecture might come in play very early, very early in the when the idea is generated to have a change. We need a change, whatever it is. But later on, just one of many options. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Stefan. And um, David, your thoughts, and then we'll go to Chris. Yeah, just just re really kind of quickly here. Um, if, if choice uh, architecture is involving people in the decisions and how we involve people in the decisions, I think this is really important for change. 
Um, there's a few things that we need to think about here is, is, first of all, if I try and drop change on people, they don't feel like they've been involved in it. So for me, I think it's really important for change management that our decisions are presented early and people can be involved in those decisions. And I think the other thing, uh, which probably comes from some of my theories, is, is to kind of uh, make sure that we have conversations and we build conversations before we go into the decision making. Because one of the things is that, you know, if I have the courtesy to listen to people who are involved in the change, then they will be find it easier to listen to me. So, so for me, it, that's really kind of key that we, 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 we tie that in. I think that's what choice or, uh, architecture involves, maybe not directly. Okay, thank you. I, I'm reading as you're as you're talking, so I'm trying to understand where this may have kind of come from from uh, uh, Christopher. Um, so uh, let's hear from uh, Chris if we can do, and then we'll go back to Matt. Chris, um, hi. I seem to be having some internet issues again, but um, if if choice architecture is setting a, a, a defined plan and a defined direction as to where the, where the change management should be leading, um, it, it can easily tend towards an authoritative way of, of leading change, which, which doesn't bode well for success in, for successful change. Um, so, you know, I, I go back to my earlier statement that, that um, methodologies, are good, but mustn't be sacred. Um, that you need to you need to be flexible enough to be able to change things, and the change manager is the person who makes sure that the concepts of that uh, choice architecture are followed, but not rigidly. Understand, understand. Thank you, uh, Chris. That's a really good point, actually. Well made. So I'm glad that your connection um, <laughs> was al allowed you to to share that, you know, with the group. Uh, Mads, uh, back to you uh, for your further thoughts. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. And a quick one. And thank you, Chris. I totally agree. The adaptability throughout the whole change is is very important. I came across some years ago uh, of this framework called Kenevan. Uh, by uh, Dave Snowden, Snowden, which is a, a very simple framework that you can use in order to figure out what kind of complexity are you actually facing in your change. So is it just a, a, a very simple one or is it a, a, a complex, chaotic one? And depending on the, the level of complexity, with respect to the adaptability that Chris is saying, of course, you choose your way forward. Uh, in, in your change. So that could also be a, a choice architecture uh, when you face the change or when you are in the change. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is really interesting. We'll see if we can get a link to that into the social chat for everybody. Um, the other thing that I would say is around change is that um, one of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to try and sell it to people. Um, it's it's much better approach if you can to explain it explanation um, requires you to use a variety of open uh, mind open-minded techniques rather than closed-minded techniques in other words it's the difference between the leading question we all had a marvelous time didn't we and the open question that says how was your weekend very different approach, yeah. So do give that a bit of thought as you're considering um, choice architecture and the way in which you know you're researching and presenting options to colleagues as part of a change initiative. Beautifully summarised there on the chat by Ella. So very well done, Ella. Thank you for going out and doing that for us. Excellent. Let's move on, if we can, Charlotte. We'll take our next question to the panel. The next questions, we've got two questions, two live questions from one of our superb um, viewers, Wolleslaw. Um, first question, how to manage the cancellation, especially fallout from stakeholders? The second question is related, and, and I'll ask that next. All right, okay, well, let's start off with the kind of situation where you embark on a journey and then suddenly you have to actually change your mind and, and turn around and say, nope, we're not, you know, we were part of a program or the program was part of a portfolio. We're not going to continue with this particular piece of work. Mads, um, 
portfolio management is all about prioritization, reprioritization. I'm sure that this is something very familiar to colleagues around the world. What are your thoughts on how best to manage this kind of situation? Yeah, so in the first place, when I saw the question, I was thinking that it was the stakeholders who was actually, you know, leaving the project or not supporting or not, you know, following the project. Uh, so if I may, I will start by ans answering that one. So, so for me, why are people leaving or why are people resisting the, the change? Usually it's because of uh, lack of understanding. Of course, it could also be other priorities, but it's usually one of the things is lack of understanding why are we actually doing this change. So actually talking about, you know, the impact, the value, the benefits of uh, of, of the project is, is key um, to, to make people continuously support uh, the project. So that was one way that I would go. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that. David, your thoughts, please. Yeah, look, um, th this can be quite painful, um, uh, cancelling uh, the change, and we do need to be careful. Um, there's a few things that will happen as we as we try and cancel an initiative. Um, the credibility of some senior managers can be affected by this. So uh, it's really important that it is properly managed. Um, I don't not mean just by, by trying to save face, but understanding the effect on individuals. And uh, this can uh, support change fact fatigue. Uh, so we need to be really, really careful. Um, so I, I think it's about being open and honest with those being affected by the change, uh, being open and honest so they can see the effect as opposed to just pulling the plug uh, because it's too painful or too hard. Um, I think it's a, yeah, it brings it back bad memories, guys. So yes, this is hard. <laughs> It's the kind of thing that haunts you in life, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, particularly the more that you were invested in something. Oh, my goodness me. The more that you need a little break before reinvesting in whatever the substitute initiative happens to be. Um, Ron, your thoughts about the, the, the biggest guillotine in uh, life? Very, uh, very quickly. Um, Hypothetically, I've never actually been involved in a project which has been cancelled. I've been involved in a project which has changed, et cetera. I've been involved in projects where I've left or I've been asked to leave. <laughs> yes, it's true, I have. Um, but I think um, David, David um, um, mentioned two words that I more or less ram down people's throats when I'm training is openness and honesty. There's no point in trying to cover anything up yeah if there's a budget shortfall if there's a, a too much resistance whatever then be honest about it just tell it the way it is because people will respect you more for that thank you excellent thank you very much indeed ron uh, chris final thoughts on this one um the the fallout from a situation like this depends on the on the level of trust that has been built beforehand. And hmm. I think that's, that, that is such a crucial element of any change, change initiative is to build up that trust in the beginning. And both Ron and, and David mentioned the, the concept of the, the idea of, of honesty and, and genuine, um, genuine behavior. Um, that all falls into the trust sphere. And I think trust is a massive, massive element of any change, change initiative. Very true, isn't it? You know, if you trust each other and, and you know, you can reevaluate and then, you know, you can kind of say, yeah, you know, we're, we're not going to proceed as we had intended. We're going to do something else instead and whatever that something else happens to be. So Bola's the great part A question. I think Charlotte's been queuing up part B um, in your thinking. Um, so let's move on, Charlotte, and we'll listen to part B if we can. You. So part B, have any panellists ever had to cancel midway through the introduction of a change they were managing? Okay, Stefan, um, has this happened to you? It happened to me very early in my career and I was at IBM at that time. And I had to step in for a project. It was called a project. And I had to stop it because I remember that and it was very painful to go to all the stakeholders and tell them, no, you got to take more money in your hand. And I was a young guy, 
So who, I, who was I say that? But I could convince them. And probably intuitively, I have done some choice architecture things, uh, trying to sell this to the stakeholders. But we realized that we did do it all wrong from the beginning. We did underestimate the impact um, this had on people. So there was no other way than to reset the whole thing. And then it actually became a change project. Before that, it was just a project. It was a decision. It was a deployment. It had to be done. And yes, um, this was the first time in my professional career where I really realized what distance can mean and, and uh, resistance. Thank you very much indeed. And it's, it kind of stays with you in your career, doesn't it? You learn learn a lot from these kinds of situations. Uh, David, it looks like you've been reliving moments from your past. Yeah, I mean, Charlotte, I think we, uh, in the last question, I think you stuck the knife in and now you've twisted it. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, so, so yeah, I, there's a particular one that I remember um, where we had done the technology side of the change really well. Um, it had been tested. A few of the agents uh, that were going to work on it had said, yeah, that'll work fine. And we started to roll this out across a network of customer services and relationship managers. Um, and yeah, it just they just went nuts over this. It's not, not going to work. It slows us down. It's actually we're not the right people to do this in the first place. Um, and yeah, so so we had to pull it. Uh, we had to go backwards, and it had a big effect on the organisation at the time because it was tied into regulatory. And we'd, we'd we'd spoken to the regulators about how we do this, and we decided to go ahead. And the reason, I suppose, was that this was driven from a top down. Regulators say this. This is how we solve the problem. And we hadn't spoken to the agents at the end of the line who go. Okay, is this going to work for you? And then going, what? That's not. Well, we can't make that decision. Why are you putting it on us? Um, so yeah, um, yeah, that was pretty harsh because we'd spent a lot of time with a lot of IT up updates, and uh, yeah, I was on the floor trying to get people to use it, and I, I felt it was successful initially. Yeah, but it wasn't. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you know, these things happen, and we learn from them, and everybody learns from them. Um, Ron, uh, your thoughts on this uh, yeah, summar um, summarised experience? Yeah, I've noticed people are giving anecdotes, so I'll give one. Tower Hamlets, London. <laughs> I was brought in as a change manager. They were implementing a, I can't remember exactly what it was, a technology project. Um, and I spoke to the sponsor, and the first thing I said was, you already have a team established? Yes. Okay, I'd like to interview the team first before I start, you know, before I start working. So having, I think the team was about eight people. So having interviewed the team, I was horrified. They were all press ganged into the project. Yeah, no change experience, no nothing. So um, unfortunately, I went to the sponsor and I said, um, I have to cancel. I, I cannot manage this project with the people that I've got uh, successfully. So I have a week's notice in my contract, and I'd like to give you a week's notice. But here are some, some suggestions that I would like to make to you about, you know, making sure that the team is up to speed, etc., for the next person to come in and manage. But I personally don't think I can manage this project a successful outcome okay all right well thank you very much indeed panel for sharing those experiences in um doing that 180 degree about turn when we've been working on things and also helping others to accept i think acceptance is a big part of change actually uh, it's a good word to to consider because if we accept the situation then we are actually ready to move forward if you don't accept the situation, then actually you're you're kind of stuck for a little while until that degree of acceptance improves to a point at which you can then begin to rebuild and think about the future and so on. So thank you very much indeed. Boulder's Law, brilliant questions. Um, as ever, you snuck two in there, so that's okay. We'll give you that, my friend, all right, today. Very good. Charlotte, let's move on. I think we might have time for one last question to the panel. Thanks, Nick. We've got our last live question, and it's from Caleb. He asks, sorry, they ask, what metrics should be considered critical while evaluating a change initiative? 
So metrics, folks, um, uh, hard metrics, soft metrics. Mads, what are your thoughts? What would you consider critical when you're trying to evaluate a change initiative? Uh, and again, I love this question um, because the, it is key to, to change. Uh, so, and I would hate when I say it depends, but then again, I would always say, when is a, when is a change successful? And for me, what I'm always driving towards is stakeholder satisfaction, not happiness necessarily, but stakeholder satisfaction. What are we aiming for? What is the impact that we are driving? Uh, what is the value or benefit? And have a, you know, what I do regularly, monthly or so, with the key stakeholders being the sponsor, the, the, the project owner or key business uh, people, is that I ask them on a regular basis. So they are uh, key stakeholders. Are we still on our way to success in our project? And have a dialogue about that. Of course, then we also have some, some uh, measurable metrics, but the key thing is that question, are we still running towards the expected benefit or uh, that we uh, aim for? I think you're right. I think there's certainly a role here as a facilitator, um, as somebody that's helping to manage change, to help folks come up with meaningful metrics and that's not necessarily the classic ones but it's in their own language in their own world words what will what does success look like here you know um and if we're able to do that then we're in a very different ball game because suddenly it, it's it's personal it becomes something that you can buy into because it's meaningful not just in your industry but also inside your organization this is the way that we speak our language it's our language it's not somebody else's theorem you know that we're measuring ourselves against so thank you Mads. um ron and then chris please your e metrics kpis call them what you want should be contained in your business case in terms of business benefits and they should be the ones that you should be working towards however my view is there are two key metrics that I think should be measured. One is a pre-go live metric and one is a post-go live metric. The pre-go live metric is business readiness. Is the, bed, is the business ready to work with this solution, which is a cyclical once a month measurement of business readiness um, through whatever mechanism you want, you know, through survey monthly or whatever, asking the same group of stakeholders, the same group of questions under certain um, aspects of the of, of the um, project, okay? And you benchmark each month's um, results against each other and you should see an increase. So you can have a score and so long as you reach that score, then you're ready. If you don't reach that score, there's a conversation to be had about are we ready? Uh, how far away are we from that score? Post go live, it's all about user usage and adoption. At the end of the day, if people don't pick up and use and adopt what you have delivered as a solution, where's your ROI? Where's your return on investment? Nowhere. Yeah. So return on investment, and you're looking probably at something like a three month measurement process, maybe longer um, for usage and adoption. They are two different things, but they should be measured together. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, Chris, your thoughts, and then we'll go to David. Um, I, I agree with Ron that a lot of those things have to be determined in advance, that they need to be be clearly stated. But one one metric that that I particularly want to make sure that it is included in any assessment is is that of culture, and I think culture plays a huge role in um, in change management, and you have to take into account, you know, the the power distance relationships that exist, the the risk averse nature of of the culture that can drive the particular change in in lots of different directions. So um, in assessing the success of anything, you need to take into account the culture of the stakeholders. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chris. And uh, David, final thoughts on this one. I, I think it can be difficult to set up metrics. and I'm always nervous if we just take them from the top down. But one of the things I would do is, is, is see the change like learning 
and to try and define some learning outcomes and some metrics against the learning outcomes. I think that's a really useful way to look at change for because to me, change is very, very like learning. It can't be imposed on, uh, on top of you. You have to be brought along with it. So, so I would suggest that we, we look at some learning outcome type or change outcomes uh, to help us uh, define the metrics. Very good. Change outcomes. That's a great phrase to finish a session all about change management and how do we become a change manager in 2024? What's available to us working in distributed ways across cultures and across time zones and so on. So excellent. So let's hear our closing remarks from the panel. Uh, Ron, if I may, I'll come to you first for just a couple of sentences, please, and then we'll go to David. Hey. Um, as usual, a great show, great questions, um, good engagement. I enjoyed it, as I always do. Um, sometimes maybe I'm a bit controversial, but you know, whatever, that's me. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, viewers and my other panellists for answering such interesting questions in an interesting way. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. Thank you for joining. Uh, David and then Chris. Um, yeah, look, guys, thank you very much. And um, delighted that I uh, from this from this session, I need to go off and do a little bit of research. I need to have a look a bit more on choice architecture. Uh, so I think that's really, 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 really key. And uh, uh, so that that's kind of good. I think I think finally, I think the role of a change manager, I think, is going to become more and more important over the next few years. I think we're heading into an area with artificial intelligence when we get our heads around it in the next few years is going to um, have a big effect on organizations uh, over the next three to five years. I don't think we even have a clue what the actual effect will be. So I think it's going to be really key. Uh, and that's it. Yes. Thanks very much, guys. Wise words, David. I, I think uh, now is the time to figure out what differentiates you from the machines as a human being and really, really yes. focus on that. So totally agree with that. Um, Chris, your thoughts, and then we'll go to Stefan. Yes, thank you very much. I enjoyed the whole panel discussion. I often think in these discussions, I wish when I had entered into my initial leadership roles that I had more theory um, on, on change management in my, in my back pocket. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a quality that I think every, every leader needs and you, you, need it, you need that theory behind you, not, not prescriptive, but um, as, a, as a guide. Absolutely right. Thank you very much, Chris. It's an absolute pleasure um, to have you on the panel today. Uh, Stefan and then Mads. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, and uh, thanks, APMG team. It's always being on this session is I think David nailed it a bit down is that you come back with something you'll have to learn yourself. So that, <laughs> that's what making it great being a panelist. Now, for those of our visitors who, who consider to become change manager or improve that, um, maybe one word I would like to mention here is that what is what is a change, which means actually something that was there before does no longer exist and won't be needed. So it, it and that refers to habit, behavior, and attitude. That that is what what really makes change is that as if it was never never different before. And that's what you have to keep in mind as a change manager. And that will give you if you if you check that as a as a guideline then you know what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. Great thinking there and really great guidance to finish the show on. Uh, Mads, your reflections on today, then we'll hear from Charlotte. Thanks, Nick, and thank you to you all. It uh, has been great questions, great, great discussions on this huge topic. For me, uh, change is about people. So key for me when running change and being involved in change is to, first of all, understand why we're doing it. and then understand, I mean, what's in it for the people, what are they looking for and help them understand and transfer. And uh, Stefan, just a quick comment on everything is evolving. Yes, and, and that's why one of my favorite thought leaders is actually uh, Ralph Stacey, who is touching upon this key thing that everything is evolving. And you as a change lead, change manager, need to you know uh, accept that and work with that. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Mads. Um, Charlotte, an interesting um, opening on the subject of change uh, for 2024. Uh, your reflections on today? It's been a, an interesting, with lots of variations on, on how to become a change manager. And, and change is a big topic, and it's a very popular topic at the moment. Um, thank you to our viewers that submitted questions and thank you to our panelists, as always, for your contributions. Um, I've been able to say this quote once this year, and I'm going to say it again because it's just as applicable. Quote from Back to the Future, Martin McFly, if you, can, <laughs> if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. There you go. So we've gone from the, uh, the, the academic all of the way through the spectrum to Hollywood as well. OK, so there you go. And a great call to action. So thank you, Charlotte. Totally agree with that. Um, thank you on behalf of our producers online to everybody who made a contribution today. Thank you, panellists, on their behalf for brilliant answers as ever and putting yourself forward. It's been an absolute pleasure. Now, um, over on the APMG website, you may, of course, search for answers to more than 2,100 questions that have been previously answered on Level Up and our other events. It's totally free, of course, and it connects you with experts from all over the world. Don't forget that you may listen to the audio versions of the shows on your preferred podcast platform. Just search for APMG International Level Up Your Career and you will find us easily enough. Coming up this week, on Wednesday, we actually have a registered event, excuse me, in collaboration with KPMG in Denmark which is all about challenging your perspectives on the best practice in IT service management. So do hop over to the website and register yourself for that. It's going to be a very interesting discussion. Friday of this week at 2 p.m. UK time, we're going to be looking at starting your career as a project manager. Um, before on Monday, we're going to look at how to facilitate like a pro, Monday the 29th, that is 8 a.m. UK time. Don't forget, head over to YouTube, Give the video a like, please, and subscribe. Share the video recordings with your colleagues. It would be super helpful for you to do that. And just ask us. We will, of course, send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG and learn some more in 2024. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next time.